that would take place uh, 10 hours from now, I think it's uh, important for us to do uh, everything that we possibly can, or 12, excuse me, 14 hours from now. Uh, it's very important that we take this action and do it as quickly and uh, as well as we possibly can. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. Morning, your reserves this time. The gentlelady from New York. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. I thank the gentleman for yielding me the customary 30 minutes, and I yield myself such time as I may consume. Gentlelady is recognized. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my uh, distinguished colleague is absolutely right. This is the rest of the bus. But it's going to be a little while before we realize whether we are on that bus or whether we've been thrown under it. Uh, obviously, as Mr. Dreyer called attention to it, this is the bill that we have today. None of us will make any pretense at all at having read it. Now, I've been around long enough to know that things happen this way. Uh, the House uh, country is about to shut down tonight. The agencies are all prepared to close, and we can't have that. And so we find ourselves confronted here today with this completed and going through this conference. And a lot of people breathing a sigh of relief this morning, frankly, particularly the federal workers in the rest of the country, that they're not going to be faced with a shutdown of federal agencies. But although uh, we are able to avert that crisis today, uh, the 2,000 page package is not a cause for celebration, and I don't believe Mr. Dry thinks it is either, but it is a demonstration of failure. As I said, I have known cases and have been participants in cases where things like this have happened before. But to a Congress that had promised at the beginning part of the campaign uh, and what we were promised at the beginning of this term was that this would not happen anymore. Instead, it has happened over and over again. Uh, over the past 12 months, we have witnessed the utter failure to responsibly legislate a failure that has led to this massive bill that we're considering today. You've heard all of this before, but in the fall of 2010, when the, the uh, majority took over, Speaker Boehner said, we'll do away with the concept of comprehensive spending bills. He's been around a while, too, and he knows that there are times that things happen that really don't fall in line with what we wanted to, but nonetheless, he made this promise. Despite the call for deliberate appropriations process, the House was recently asked to consider a $180 billion minibus totaling 354 pages of legislation. And today, less than 24 hours, about halfway, I think, uh, we are offered a $1 trillion Magnabus appropriations bill. It was given to the members of the House today, and we're asked to vote on that. Uh, we will, of course, do that because, as I said, the looming layoff and shutdown of the federal government is something we cannot stand at this juncture or any other time. So despite the earlier promises by the GOP to separate controversial legislation, from the must-pass bill, the megabus was delayed by a battle over controversial riders. We know this could have been done much sooner, but there were five riders that had to be resolved. Uh, everything from the reproductive rights of the citizens of the District of Columbia to energy-saving light bulbs. Mr. Speaker, this House has spent more time debating light bulbs than we have putting American people to work. It's, it's really been an outrage. We've talked about this so many times before, but nonetheless, in all the contemplations, all the conference work, light bulbs have survived. I know that that's a sigh of relief to everybody in America who had no idea we were spending so much of their time micromanaging that, uh, the light bulbs. But this is a sign, I think, of a larger failure, a failure of governing. A vision that we have gone through all this year that was based on brinksmanship and threats, an all or nothing game of chicken with the colleagues of the American people. And everybody is exhausted from will we do it, won't we do it, can we do it, must we do it. Part of that uh, has resulted in a lessening of the credit rating of the United States of America for the very first time. So instead of spending the year finding common ground, with the Democrat colleagues, the majority spent the year advancing legislation to dismantle the EPA and to talk about light bulbs and to open federally protected lands to foreign mining companies. I find in my constituency the idea that we were going to give land to Russia around the Grand Canyon to mine for uranium is mind-boggling to people. 
We really ought to be worried about that. This is a very serious problem. Instead of spending the year finding this common ground, as I said, we have done nothing about that. So throwing partisanship to the side, the majority pushed forward with these ideological battles at the expense of the nation's welfare. And what we see this morning is the result of their divisive efforts. What we know is a process that begins with brinksmanship and threatens ends with this 2,000 page, a trillion dollar megabus crammed through the house as the clock hit zero is all we have. This is our chance to keep government from shutting down. With proper priorities and a serious effort to engage legislatures from both sides of the aisle, we could truly have a process and a product that would make American people proud. But that's not what we have here today. It's not what's been done this year. I hope sincerely, and I know that many people on both sides of the aisle hope sincerely that as the calendar turns to 2012, we can put an end to the zero-sum leadership that has been provided and finally give the responsible, bipartisan leadership that they want and deserve, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman from California. Mr. Uh, Speaker, as uh, my uh, good friends from the Appropriations Committee, Mr. Rogers and Mr. Dix, uh, congratulate each other in the, in the well, um, I'll ask them to move out of the well so that I'm able to yield three minutes to uh, my good friend from Grandfather Community who, uh, who left the Rules Committee at 1 o'clock this morning, Mr. Speaker, and went to her office to work before going down to the White House at 7.30 for uh, a tour for her constituents. And so I underscore the fact that the Virginia Fox is extraordinarily dedicated, and for that reason, and many others, I'm happy to yield her three minutes. The gentlelady from North Carolina is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the distinguished gentleman from California, the chairman of the Rules Committee, uh, to whom we all look for uh, wisdom, uh, especially at times like this. And I, I think he's been extraordinarily generous in his comments uh, this morning in talking about the bipartisan approach. Uh, we all praised the chairman and ranking member of Appropriations Committee uh, early this morning when the Rules Committee was meeting. And I think it, it is important that we celebrate uh, the bipartisan nature of this bill. As everybody will say, I'm sure today, it's not a perfect bill that's coming up. Uh, it's not pleasing everybody. Uh, it's pleasing very few people. But it is sausage making and rule making uh, at its finest. Now, I do want to, and I, and I appreciate the fact that it's the Christmas season and we want to be a little friendlier to each other during this time as we are when we're in our home districts. We are here in Congress, too. And so I'm mindful of the season and I'm mindful of the fact that we have reached a bipartisan agreement. But I do want to say um, to my colleagues across the aisle, there's an old saying that people who live in glass houses should not throw stones. Again, as my colleague from California said, we're not happy that we have a rather large bill and uh, a, a somewhat short perspective in, in time to deal with it. But this bill was out there uh, on Monday, as he pointed out, and were it not for the dilatory tactics of the Senate, we could, have had this bill on, we, we could have had this bill on the floor earlier this week, and it's certainly been out there for everybody to read. And I want to say to my colleague from across the aisle from New York, uh, saying a lot of wasted time on light bulbs. Well, Mr. Speaker, light bulbs are a symptom of the problem with this executive administration and our friends across the aisle talk about wanting to micromanage. They want to control what kind of light bulbs we have. It was a debate between the Senate Democrats and the President of the United States on whether we're going to continue to control the kind of light bulbs we have that delayed this process yesterday for many, many hours. But we need to talk about some positive things that the Republicans in this House have done this year. We've, we've stopped spending money we don't have. We've cut discretionary spending for the second year in a row for the first time since World War II. 
thanks to the changes in the way this Congress works, that Republicans brought here under the leadership of our Speaker, instead of shoveling ever larger piles of money into the federal government black hole, this bill represents another step toward reducing the size, scope, and cost of the federal government. We've been working hard to cut spending, grow the economy, and create jobs. We've protected hardworking taxpayers from Washington's waste by eliminating 42 government programs. And thanks to Republicans' efforts to stop wasteful pork barrel spending, while the Democrats included 18,000 earmarks in their final two years of spending, would the gentleman yield 30 seconds more? Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to yield additional 30 seconds. General ladies recognized for 30 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. House Republicans fulfilled our pledge to Americans by including no earmarks, no earmarks in the 2011-2012 spending bills. This is a huge success. After years of status quo pork barrel spending, Republicans have changed the culture of spending in Washington. There's much work to do, but this bill takes us in the right direction, and that's why I am urging my colleagues to support this rule and the underlying bill, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady's time has expired. The gentlelady from New York. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to yield two minutes to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Lee. The gentlelady from California is recognized for two minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, and let me thank um, Congresswoman Slaughter, the gentlelady from New York, for her leadership and for yielding. Uh, this um, is not the open and transparent process the Republicans have promised the American people. Instead, we have had a closed-door process that has stacked this critical spending bill, a bill that is necessary to make our government and our nation function, with a bunch of special interest writers. For example, gutting uh, of the IRS, that will not um, reduce deficits caused by the Bush tax cuts for the 1 percent, and that's in this bill. Helping to spread HIV and hepatitis C through dirty needles will not help our economic recovery. Yes, that will happen in this bill. Denying the women of Washington, D.C. the right, which other women have throughout the country, the right to health services, the right to have an abortion with the city's own money, not federal funds, mind you, not federal funds, but other funds, we're denying, again, low-income, mostly African-American minority women, that right in this bill. Uh, why in the world would we want to include this type of a rider in a bill to fund our government? It makes no sense. It's mean-spirited, and it's wrong. Also, why would we want to continue to have provisions to uh, pollute the air that we breathe and the water that we drink. Uh, that's in this bill with some of these riders. That will not uh, raise the failing median income of American workers. Unfortunately, again, this bill does that. Funding abstinence only, sex education. We know that fails. That won't create the millions of jobs necessary to grow the American middle class and to help more people from falling deeper into poverty. Uh, this recession, and for many, it's still a depression, it's hurting millions. Half of all Americans are either in poverty, near poor, or low income. We should be focused on lifting these families up and reigniting the American dream. May I have another 10 seconds? May I have another 10 seconds? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Sorry. The gentlelady really recognized should. for 10 seconds. Another 30 seconds. Thank another you. 30 seconds. Gentlelady. In this bill, we should have focused on creating these ladders of opportunity, removing barriers, helping to reignite the American dream for all Americans. Instead, we're scoring, I believe, political points on the backs of Washington, D.C. women and millions of poor and struggling individuals and families in this country. The process that this bill would underwent as we brought it forward to this uh, floor uh, was not a good process. I think had we had regular order, due process, we would have been able to figure some of these issues out. Thank you. The gentlelady's time has expired. The gentleman from California. Speaker, uh, I, yield myself, uh, I yield myself one minute. To uh, simply uh, make uh, a couple of very important points, and that is uh, we are here faced with this situation because of the inability of our colleagues in the other body, the United States Senate, to act.
Now, I'm just looking at the, uh, the list of uh, the conferees, and I listened to my, my friends criticize the bill, and I, I actually don't know whether my friend from Rochester is going to end up supporting the conference report or not. I didn't, I didn't get uh, a conclusion on that, but I will say that every single House member, Democrat and Republican, every subcommittee chairman, every ranking member of a subcommittee, the so-called cardinals, the chairs of the subcommittees, signed this conference report. It is bipartisan. Unfortunately, in the Senate, we have a number of members of the Senate who didn't sign the conference report. But I, I believe that we need to realize that we went for 963 days, nearly 1,000 days, Mr. Speaker, without a budget having passed from the United States Senate. We know, Mr. Speaker, that we didn't have any appropriations bills done last year. We're trying to clean this process up. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to yield three minutes to a very thoughtful, diligent new member of the Committee on Rules, the gentleman from Lawrenceville, Georgia. Uh, three minutes. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my chairman for yielding the time. And I want to thank my chairman for, for his work on opening this process up in the House. He's teamed up with our new speaker to say that regular order is the better way to do things. And I, and I want to say, and, it, and it, it needs to be said, it, it's too easy when all you do is read the headlines in this town to start pointing the finger of blame. I mean, here, here's National Journal, one of our, our dailies, uh, dim sign conference report, the White House and Senator Majority Leader Harry Reid had blocked passage of the measure. Uh, it's not about where the blame is. It's about where the successes are. When, when you look behind me, Mr. Speaker, at, at this stack of pages that represents this bill, what that represents is the work that didn't get done last year, but that Norm Dix and that Hal Rogers have come together to get done this year. When we talk about regular order and the regular order that hasn't happened this year, what we need to talk about is the fact that we had no regular order on appropriations bills last year. We got six of them passed through appropriations, uh, the, the regular order process this year. That's half. That's 50% of the way there. And I know we have a commitment from the Appropriations Committee to get the rest of them there next year. This is a success story. This is not a failure. Is this the way that I wanted to legislate 2,300 pages? No, it's not. And it's not the way that the Appropriations Committee wants to legislate, and it's not the way that any member of this House wants to legislate, and it's 50% better than what we did last year. We're going to get back to regular order. We're going to get back to regular order by clearing out the work from 2012, I'm sorry, 2011 was this year. We're now finishing 2012 today. We're going to be able to start 2013. I sit on the Budget Committee. My commitment to my friends on the Appropriations Committee is we're going to move that budget. We're going to move it early. We're going to move it on time. We're going to be done by the end of March so that you all can begin your important work. It's not just about the spending of the money. It's about the oversight of how the money is spent, and that's why regular order is so important. You know, there's only one committee in this House that comes to the Rules Committee day in and day out and says this, I want an open rule on my bill so that all members can be heard. And I do not want waivers to go along with it. I want the House to operate under regular order. There's only one, and it's the Appropriations Committee. When you see what's going on today and what we're doing in the name of completing our business for the year, understand this is the one committee in the House that wants to give everybody a say. This is the one committee in the House that tries to make every member's opinion count. And if we can successfully deal with this in the same bipartisan way that we have been throughout the year, we can move this business today and begin anew as we all want to on January 1st of next year. And I thank my chairman and I thank the appropriators for their very hard work. The time of the gentleman has expired. The gentle gentlelady from New York. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to yield four minutes. The gentleman from Massachusetts, a member of the Committee on Rules, Mr. McGovern. The General, gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized. I thank the gentlelady for yielding to me. Mr. Speaker, let me begin by thanking Chairman Rogers and uh, Ranking Member Dix for their tireless work on this bill. And I'm pleased that we're finally going to finish the appropriations process for this year. I especially want to thank the White House and Senator Reid and other key Senate and House negotiators for re removing the House Cuba provision from the final conference report. Not only was it a direct attack on the prerogatives of the executive, but it was cruel and inhumane. It would have ripped apart Cuban-American families from their relatives on the island. 
family communication, connection, and reunification have always been a cornerstone of U.S. foreign policy. It has promoted great uh, good in the case of Cuba, and it deserves the support of this Congress. And hopefully someday soon we can scrap our whole Cuba policy and open up uh, uh, lift the travel restrictions so every American can go to that, uh, visit that country. But, Mr. Speaker, I cannot let this opportunity go without commenting a little bit on the process. You know, my friend from Georgia talked about regular order. Regular order, my foot. I mean, uh, all points of order were waived uh, against this bill. Half of the uh, bills that are, half of the bills that are in this, this is pretty heavy, um, no one had an opportunity to offer a single amendment on. Um, you know, read the bill. Uh, that's what my Republican friend shouted last year. Read the bill. They used to they used this rallying cry to promote their pledge to America, where they promised to read the bill. No one read that bill. We at all. We, where are the Tea Party people uh, when you, when you want them? Uh, I, when I'm finished, I'll yield. Let yeah, me read a quote. To it. We will ensure that bills are debated and discussed in the public square by publishing the text online for at least three days before coming up for a vote in the House of Representatives." End quote. That's directly from their pledge. Um, yet here, we're, here we are today considering a 2,300-page bill that was introduced at 11.45 p.m. last night. That's not three days. That's not even 12 hours. 2,300 pages presented to this House in the dead of night. The Rules Committee didn't finish until close to 1 a.m. this morning, and here we are. Who knows for sure what's in this bill? Who in this body has had the time to read this bill as it is currently drafted? This is the not, not the way my friends promised to run this House. Well, gentlemen, this, yield. I, I, Mr. Speaker, I, I said to the gentleman I won't yield until I'm finished, and I, oh, I would exactly. appreciate not getting interrupted. Um, this is not the way you promised to run the House. This is not how you said you would do the people's business. You said you'd bring up every appropriations bill under an open rule, but you barely managed to bring up half of them. Half of the appropriations bills were never brought up before the members of this House. What happened to the Labor HHS bill? What happened to the Transportation bill, the Financial Services bill, the Interior bill, the State and Foreign Ops bill, the CJS bill? That's, you, that's not the Senate's fault. That's not Barack Obama's fault. You're in control of this House of Representatives. You have the power to bring bills up to the floor. You couldn't be bothered to bring them up. Sure, you have found time to bring up bills to defund Planned Parenthood and National Public Radio. You had time to bring up bills that would allow unsafe people to carry concealed weapons from one state to another. Oh, my favor, you, you found time to reaffirm our national motto. That's what all the American people are worried about, whether we're going to reaffirm our national motto. But you couldn't find time to debate bills funding our nation's roads, bridges, national parks, and community health centers. You couldn't find time to do your job. Now, I'm glad the appropriators reached an agreement, but it's sad that this Republican Congress has once again broken the promise they made to the American people. A 2,300-page bill, something this important and detailed, can't be read and examined in a few hours. That's why you promised three days to read the bill, but you couldn't even keep that promise. I remember, uh, and I remember when, uh, when they were in charge at an earlier time when immunity for prescription drug companies was inserted into an appropriations bill without anyone knowing about it. Now, I, I, I ask an additional one minute. So many to, uh, I hope very much that I'm recognized you. One, uh, I, I, have, I have the <laughs> utmost respect for the chairman of the appropriations committee, and I take him at his word when he says there are no earmarks in this bill that there are no special provisions, that there is nothing snuck in here at the last minute. Um, I'm a trusting guy, but I also believe in verifying things, because in the past, things have been snuck into these bills without us knowing about it. But look at this bill. Look at this bill. It's 2,300 pages. It was just introduced in the dead of night. It was reported out of the Rules Committee almost at 1 a.m. in the morning. And it, this is different than what was posted a few days ago. Read the bill, Mr. Speaker. The new Republican Congress promised that we could read the bill. Too bad they are breaking that pledge to America. I hope, Mr. Speaker, that next year we will go back to regular order, where all the appropriations bills will come to the floor and they will all be debated individually under an open process. Yeah. I hope we get to that point. But I want to say, uh, finally, that the, fa the fact that these bills were not all brought up has nothing to do with the Senate, has nothing to do with the President. It has everything to do with the leadership of this House.
Gentleman's time has expired. To the, to the gentleman. The gentleman's time. Yielding, the gentleman Speaker, from Massachusetts' his time has expired. The gentleman from California Just, is recognized. Um, would, would you yield time to the gentleman so I could engage in a discussion with him? I'd say to my friend from Rochester. I believe the time is the, now the, yours, the, is it not? The chair now, has. The, the gentleman from Massachusetts' time has expired. Who seeks time? Well, Mr. Speaker, may I inquire uh, how much time remains? The on gentleman from California has uh, 13 and a half minutes remaining, and the gentlelady from New York has 16 and a half minutes. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, the, I'd the, like the to. The gentleman ask my su will suspend. The chair will receive a message. Mr. Speaker, a message from the Senate. Mr. Speaker. Madam Secretary. I have been directed by the Senate to inform the House that the Senate has passed without amendments, H.R. 3421, cited as the Fallen Heroes of 9 11 Act. Thank you. The gentleman from California is recognized. I yield to my friend from Worcester. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I might consume. California is recognized. I'd like to yield to my friend from Worcester and engage in a discussion. Uh, I'm sorry, would the gentlelwoman like me to yield? I'm happy to yield to my friend from Rochester if she'd like me to yield. Would the gentleman would like me to yield to her? I mean, I've just been recognized. Would, who seeks time? Mr. Speaker, I think I've just been recognized with who the time of I not. The gentleman from California is recognized. Would the gentlewoman from Rochester like me to yield to her? Mr. Speaker, uh, would the gentlewoman from New York like me to yield to her, Mr. Speaker? I do not. If I could be allowed okay, then, Mr. to say Speaker, something uh, here. Okay, I'll reclaim my I time, was, then, Mr. I, Mr. Speaker. The woman from New York is not say, recognized. The gentleman from California I'm happy to yield to my time. friend from Rochester if she'd like to ask me a question or ask the chair a question. I'm more than happy to yield to her. Uh, I would say, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I yield myself such time as I might consume. The gentleman's recognized. In the spirit of bipartisanship, in the spirit of recognizing that we need to ensure that the government doesn't shut down in a minute. At midnight, I'd like to engage in a discussion with my friend from Worcester, as I was trying to when he was in the well, to say a, a few things. First of all, uh, as we all know, last year no appropriations uh, uh, bills were passed. Not, nothing was completed uh, in the last Congress. Nothing at all. And we have spent, with Mr. Rogers and Mr. Dix, uh, virtually this entire year cleaning up the work of the last Congress. And the gentleman will recognize that, I'm sure. I mean, the gentleman acknowledges that, Mr. Speaker, uh, that we have spent this year working to clean up the fact that no appropriations work was done last year, and I'm happy well, to yield to my friend. Yeah, I, I think we're talking about this year, aren't we? Uh, are I, we, talk, are we talking, talking about what the work is this year? Yes, absolutely. And if I can reclaim and, my time, Mr. Oh, okay. Speaker, I'll say absolutely. We're talking about this year, and the responsibility that was thrust on yes. us this year was so overwhelming because last year nothing was done. Nothing was accomplished. And so, so what's happened, Mr. Speaker, is we are in a position where the appropriators have been shouldering this responsibility, and unfortunately our colleagues in the other body, the majority leadership there, Senator Reid and others, according to the National Public Radio report, as I discussed this morning, as others have acknowledged, was pointed out in the, the publications out this morning, this was held hostage and that's why we are where we are. Now, my friends are enjoying holding up the 2300 page conference report and the additional 700 pages of the, uh, the joint manager's uh, report that is included in there. But guess what, Mr. Speaker? All of that was available, all of that was available on Monday, five days ago, and the only exception in this measure is one item has been pulled out. That one item pulled out happens to be the Cuba language that was there. And there was obviously a lot of concern about that. That was pulled out. Then one item, item was added, and that has to do with the Commodities Future Trading Corporation. And so as our colleagues hold up this uh, thousands of pages, we need to realize it's been available since Monday. This is Friday, Mr. Speaker. That's more than the three-day layover requirement, and we pointed to these minor modifications. So with that, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to yield two minutes to the very distinguished Those chair of the Committee on Appropriations, my very good friend from Somerset, Kentucky, Mr. Rogers. The gentleman from Kentucky is recognized for two minutes. I thank the uh, chairman for yielding. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the members of the Rules Committee. Chairman Dreyer and all of the members of that committee uh, are required to work at all hours of the day and night. In fact, uh, we were testifying before the committee last night at 1230, uh, seeking the rule on this uh, bill. But that's par for the course for the Rules Committee, uh, who work long, laborious hours with very little thanks. Uh, but I want to thank them. And I want to say to the uh, Chairman Dreyer and to uh, the gentlelady, ranking member, uh, there's got to be a special place reserved in heaven for those that labor in this vineyard. Uh, so thank you for the hard work that you do. Uh, 
I want to say thanks to my, my colleague, uh, my ranking member on the full committee, Mr. Dix, who's with us in the chamber. Uh, he and I have worked uh, hand in hand in this uh, process all year long. Uh, it's a very productive relationship. I value his advice and, uh, and his help, and he has been free uh, to give that advice and help all year long. And, and this is the product of, of our work, uh, a bipartisan, comprehensive effort to fund the government. And we want to get us back to regular order. For the last several years, uh, before we took over this body, uh, appropriations was a mess. We didn't do any appropriations. We lurched from one continuing resolution to another, uh, leaving uh, the public uh, bewildered. And so Mr. Dix and I have determined, along with Senator Inouye and our colleagues in the Senate, to restore regular order, bringing one bill at a time to this floor, letting it be amended and debated at length, and then uh, into a conference with our colleagues across the way. That's what we want to get back to. Now, this, this bill that's before us today, it's a huge bill. I do not like a, omnibus bills. Neither one of us does. We're not going to have them. But in order to clean up the mess that was left us, we had no choice. Can I have an additional the, uh, My friend, an additional 30 seconds. And I'd ask my friend to yield to me if he would. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker I, I thank my friend for yielding. And I'd like to just say that I, I misspoke. The agreement was reached between Mr. Rogers and Mr. Inouye on Monday. And the, the pages were not made available until it was filed at 1227, 1227, uh, at just after midnight on Wednesday. But the agreement, excuse me, well, it was after midnight on the Wednesday. The time of the gentleman so from Kentucky has expired. And I'm happy to yield my friend an additional 30 seconds. So I just want to say that I did not speak when I said the agreement was struck seconds. on Monday. The agreement was struck on Monday. It was made available after midnight on Wednesday. And I, I'd like to yield an additional 30 seconds to my friend from Somerset. Recognize for an additional 30 seconds. We're here because th this bill is the product of our committee. But most importantly, it's a product of our subcommittees, Republicans and Democrats. They're the ones who put this bill together. Collectively, all of those nine subcommittees are represented in this package here. It's been vetted by... Republicans and Democrats, House and Senate, uh, all the way through. There are no earmarks here. There are no airdropped provisions in this bill. It is a good bill. It's not perfect. I don't like omnibus bills. Uh, but in cleaning up the mess left us, this bill is a good faith effort to get 012 out of the way so that in 013 this January, uh, we will be able to uh, go to work on getting the 13, uh, uh, 2013 bills done in the regular way. I want to thank the staff for all the hard work they've done all year long. And I thank our colleagues. Your gentleman's time has expired. The gentlelady from New York. Mr. Speaker, let me take uh, 30 seconds to say that all I was recognized. trying to do uh, at the last month there was to say that Mr. Dreyer, 16 minutes, were not adequate for him, I would be pleased to yield him one of my 13. Uh, that was my aim there, and I'm pleased to yield two minutes to the gentleman from Washington, the ranking member of appropriations, Mr. Dix, who's worked so hard. The gentleman from it. Washington is recognized for two minutes. Uh, I thank the uh, ranking member of the Rules Committee for uh, uh, yielding me two minutes. I just want to say that uh, this has been a collaborative, bipartisan effort to put this bill here. Mr. McGovern and others have explained some of the concerns about the process, and they're legitimate, and we hope to do better next year. I am committed to working with the chairman to bring all 12 appropriation bills to the floor separately next year so that we can exercise regular order. We did have to do H.R. 1 in the spring, which took a, was all 12 bills from 11, and we, had, we spent uh, a week on it. And uh, we also uh, had over 500 amendments. And it just showed you that the members want to have a chance to amend these bills. And if you don't bring them to the floor, like under regular order, then you don't have an opportunity to do that. And so we're going to try to improve on our record. We got six to the floor this year. Uh, I, I think we can do better next year if we get started early. So we make a pledge to work on that. I want to compliment our chairman, Mr. Rogers, for his uh, openness, his willingness to consider 
all points of view, uh, he could not have done a better job. And to have the patience of Job to, uh, to, to listen to everybody and still debating the last few items in this bill this week. Now, my good friend, Mr. Dreyer, who I have enormous respect for, we work together on trade issues all the time. The only thing I would say about the other body is that they weren't doing something that was evil. They were trying to get an unemployment compensation bill enacted. They're trying to get a, an extension of the payroll tax bill and some other important provisions that are in, crucial to the American people. And so what they did by slowing us down a little bit was to give an opportunity to get that work done. And as much as I would have preferred to go forward, can you, 30 seconds? I'd be pleased to yield 30 seconds. Well, my friend, as much as I just one second. Would, would have preferred to go forward, uh, we had to acknowledge that this was important work that needed to be accomplished. Would my I friend yield, yield very chairman. briefly? I yield to the chairman. Around here, that today is sort of a special day for the gentleman. Is it true that a few years ago you were born on this date? It was n not just a few years ago, Mr. Chairman. Well, this is my birthday. I, I, we didn't plan it this way. I want to make sure that the chairman of the rules. <laughs> Happy birthday. Have, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, when my friend yield uh, I, me briefly, the gentleman from Washington has Mr. expired. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Speaker, I'd like California. to yield myself 15 seconds and to, and to say to my friend, first of all, happy birthday. Thank you. And the great birthday present is that we will not shut the government down, and uh, we obviously will see this measure pass today. I also wanted to say to my friend that I believe we've made history here. To have any member of the House stand up, especially on his birthday, Mr. Speaker, and speak in complimentary ways of the other body is, in fact, uh, historic in and of itself. <laughs> Time of the gentleman from California. I just wanted to make sure everybody got the full picture. Thank you. Um, gentleman from California. Mr. Speaker, may I inquire of the chair how much time is remaining? Gentleman from side? California has seven and a quarter minutes, and the gentlelady from New York has uh, 13 and a half minutes remaining. In light of that, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to reserve the balance gentlelady of time. Gentlelady from New York. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to yield three minutes to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey. Gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized for three minutes. I thank the gentlelady. This is a. Uh, this is the end of the year, and so the Republicans need a few presents uh, for the oil industry, for the coal industry. Uh, and that's what this final weekend is all about. How do we get those presents? And so they tried and tried in this bill to roll back many, many environmental laws, but they have been unable to do so. But what they have said is, just give us one thing. Give us one trinket, perhaps, a, a symbol of our success in rolling back the laws of energy efficiency in our country. And so within this bill, the Republicans have now successfully inserted a provision which rolls back the light bulb efficiency law, which the companies of our country and the rest of the world must comply with. Now, what does that mean? Well, for consumers in our country, it will be six billion dollars per year that they will have to pay in higher electricity bills every year that they are alive. What else does it mean? Well, it means that the coal industry is happy because they generate half the electricity in our country, so they'll burn more coal in order to generate that electricity in order for the American people to use less efficient light bulbs. And that greenhouse gas will go up into the atmosphere, and since the Republicans don't believe the planet is warming, what do they care? Just roll back the light bulb efficiency standards. What's the next bill that's up? Well, that's on can we give a payroll tax break to the ordinary Americans? Can we have unemployment insurance for the millions of people unemployed? They're saying, well, we'll consider it, but you can't tax billionaires to find the money for that. And by the way, we want to trinket there as well. Let's, let's make sure that that final bill they're saying has an exemption for environmental laws so you can build a huge pipeline, the Keystone XL pipeline, extra large pipeline, right through the middle of America, waiving the environmental laws. And, ladies and gentlemen, 
at the same time having no guarantee that the oil that comes from Canada through the United States will be sold in the United States. They won't accept that provision, neither TransCanada nor the Republicans, even though they say we would do it for our national security. So here we are at the end of the year, light bulb efficiency out the door. They'd like to do the same thing, by the way, for increased efficiency in the vehicles which we drive, the planes which we fly in, the boats which we uh, which sail here in the United States as we watch the Middle East in turmoil, as we see uh, Iran uh, and Iraq perhaps growing closer together. They are trying to reduce the efficiency uh, of, uh, of our country uh, by making it more likely we consume oil, more likely uh, that we... Can, can I have 30 additional seconds? Is that possible? I'm pleased to yield another minute. I, I thank you, General Lee, very for much. One minute. So here we have, again, a misunderstanding on the part of the Republicans on our key national security issue. And that is changing our relationship with the, with the energy sources which we consume because it comes disproportionately out of the Straits of Hormuz, out of the Middle East, into our country. And so this issue goes right to the core, this light bulb efficiency. It's a small symbol of all the other things that they oppose <laughs> in terms of increasing the efficiency of our society. And it's stuck right in the middle of this so-called uh, omnibus bill. Uh, and they wouldn't be happy unless they got it. Mind you, this attempt that was defeated earlier this year on the House floor when members could vote for it, it must be snuck into uh, the uh, omnibus end of the year bill. So whether it be the XL pipeline for the oil industry, whether it be uh, the light bulb bill for the coal industry, uh, whether it be the, uh, the billionaire tax uh, break staying on the books, uh, rather than helping to make sure ordinary people get tax breaks. Billionaires, oil, Time of the gentleman industry, from Massachusetts that is, is what the, the gentleman is from California. I urge a no vote. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. At this time, I'm happy to yield two minutes to my good friend from Bainbridge Township, Ohio, Mr. La Tourette. The gentleman from Ohio is recognized for two minutes. I, I thank the chairman and I thank the speaker for the recognition. You know, one of the useless uh, sort of pieces of trivia I carry around in my head is that the, uh, the originator of Superman comics was from Cleveland, Ohio, and I think he sold the rights to it for a pittance and very sorry after that. One of the things I could never get my arms around in the Superman series was the bizarro Superman. As I listen to this debate, I think that I have landed uh, in a bizarro world. And to go to another sort of uh, children's story, everybody knows the story of the three little pigs, those who are criticizing the process, or the criticism of the process, not those, the criticism of the process that has brought this bill to the floor is a little bit like there's a fourth little pig that didn't even bother to build a straw house or a wood house, but gets to the brick house where the, uh, where the, uh, the wolf can't get in and is complaining that the brick furniture is too hard. Now listen, no budget was produced in the last Congress, not one. And so for the process lovers around here, you know where all the numbers came from that we had to deal with in the Appropriations Committee? In the mind of one man from Wisconsin who is now retired. That didn't happen. A budget was passed. And you know what else? The budget this year gave lower numbers for the second time straight under this, uh, this uh, majority. And it is a little more difficult to spend less money than more money. It's easier to spend more money. But Mr. Dix and Mr. Rogers did something that was never done under the stewardship of the previous speaker. And that is we had bills come up in subcommittee. And you know what? Any member could offer an amendment. Good amendments, bad amendments, stupid amendments, wonderful <laughs> amendments, and we voted on them. They went to full committee. The same thing occurred. And I'm going to tell you, the bills came to the floor under open rules. I think I could count on, I wouldn't have to take off my shoes to figure out the number of open rules that occurred under the previous speaker's administration. As they privatized the nation's health care, one-seventh of the economy of the United States, as they put in place a national carbon tax with no amendments. So for those who are squealing about process, it's, it's, it's really uh, an inappropriate exercise. And relative to the other body, and I have nothing but respect for Mr. Dix, but to say that the Senate wasn't doing anything nefarious by linking this bill that was going to put on furlough and shut down the government at midnight tonight and link that to the, uh, the payroll tax cuts and others. Listen, the Senate has become again and again and again the place where legislation goes to die. 
And it is not enough to sit over there in the lofty Senate chamber and say, we don't like what you did, House, and not produce a product. The time has come for them to pass a bill, and then the process is we're only one-third of the government. You can't have this bill unless the Senate passes it and the President signs it. So again, Merry Christmas to all, and we should get on with this. The time of the gentleman's expired. The gentlelady from uh, New York. Mr. Speaker, I yield two minutes to the gentleman from Mississippi, the ranking member on Homeland Security, Mr. Thompson. The gentleman from Mississippi is recognized for two minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, I rise in opposition to the rule and the underlying measure, the conference report of H.R. 2055. When presented with this 1,219-page funding bill, it's hard to know where to start. As a ranking member of the Homeland Security Committee, I choose to start by looking at how it will affect our nation's first responders and the communities they protect. This package, 10 years after the attacks of September 11, 2001, is a dangerous departure from the path we've been on as a nation to build up our preparedness and our response capabilities. It abandons the men and women we count on to save lives. Since 9-11, there's been a general recognition that as a nation, we are dangerously unprepared for the emerging threats we face. That is, the, that is why past Congresses established an array of federal grant programs targeted to specific homeland security gaps and needs. Across the country, we've seen the benefits of the path laid by the Congresses toward preparedness as evidenced by the response to this year's wave of disasters. Today, however, this Congress not only strays from the path, but bulldozes it. The conference report slashes more than $2 billion from first responder funding. Last year, $3.38 billion was provided to communities across the country under FEMA's grant program, most notably the State Homeland Security Grant Program, Urban Area Security Initiative, Metropolitan Medical Response System, Operation Stone Garden, Citizen Corps Program, Port Security Grant Program, Transit Security Grant Programs, Interoperability Emergency Communication Grant Program, and Emergency Operations Centers. This year, under this package, just $1.35 billion is designated for all the grant programs. Uh, another 30 seconds, I'd like please. to yield the gentleman another minute, please. The gentleman's recognized for one minute. Thank you very much. That is less than half of what we provided this last year. To make matters worse, this package punts responsibility for the tough decisions about funding levels for each program to Secretary Napolitano. The approach taken here should surprise no one. Tough decisions about funding have been punted throughout this session, and as a result, the Congress has moved from shutdown crisis to shutdown crisis. If this package is enacted, the Congress will be punting responsibility for meeting the homeland security challenges of a post-9-11 world to state, local, and tribal governments. The timing of the shift of responsibility could not be worse. We must not ignore the calls from public safety and first responder organizations that have warned us about devastating effects of cuts. For this reason, and probably a hundred more, I oppose the Congress report. <coughs> And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California. Speaker, uh, I'd inquire my friend how many uh, speakers she has remaining on her side. We have no further speakers. May I inquire if my colleague has any? Uh, if, I, I'm, I, I plan to close and then move the previous question so we can move ahead to ensure we don't shut down the government. Well, I am I'm, uh, prepared to close this with just one time. small statement. The gentlelady from uh, New York is recognized. Urging my colleagues to vote no on the previous question uh, and the a marathon martial law rule and yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman from California. <laughs> Gentleman's recognized. Speaker, uh, we all know that the American people are hurting. We have a protracted unemployment uh, problem that has gone on for an extended period of time, the longest period of time since the Great Depression. And um, it's important for us to realize the, um, the reasons for this. One of the very important reasons for this is that we have seen a dramatic expansion of the size and scope and reach of government. 
Um, during the four years that my friends on the other side of the aisle were in the majority, uh, we witnessed an 82 percent increase in non-defense discretionary spending, an 82 percent increase. We now have a $15 trillion national debt, and I think Democrats and Republicans alike acknowledge that that cannot be sustained. And um, as I've been saying throughout this week, our job is jobs. Right now, our job is jobs. We need to have a laser-like focus on creating job opportunities for our fellow Americans. People who are so frustrated that they've given up even uh, the um, e given up the effort to look for work. And so that's why the things that we're dealing with today are so critically important to address those needs. Now, since there has been bipartisan recognition that we can't continue down the road with uh, an 82 percent increase in non-defense discretionary spending, which we witnessed over the past several years, uh, it's important for us to ha come together. And that's exactly what's happened. This is Norm Dick's birthday, and we're very happy about that. We're happy that on his birthday, we're going to see a bipartisan agreement that will bring about a $95 billion reduction in non-defense discretionary spending, a $95 billion reduction. And that's what this work product does, Mr. Speaker. And again, bipartisan recognition and even bicameral recognition and even recognition from down Pennsylvania Avenue with the second branch of government that we are right now altering the course that we had been on of dramatically increasing spending. And we're doing it, Mr. Speaker, in a very fair and balanced and open way. I don't like the process that got us to where we are right now. I said earlier that uh, I believe that the, the, this uh, multi-thousand page package was available on Monday. It was agreed to on Monday. It wasn't made available until early uh, uh, Wednesday morning, Thursday morning. But we are where we are. And uh, there was an agreement. Mr. Inouye and Mr. Rogers came to this agreement uh, on Monday. We could have, uh, on Monday, we could have done this earlier, but we know that our friends in the other body chose, as has been characterized in the media, and as I said, I wasn't going to say it earlier, but it's been characterized in the media as having held hostage this very important appropriations bill, and we dealt with the threat of a government shutdown that would take place 13 hours from now. And uh, we are not going to see that happen. We're not going to see that happen because Mr. Dix and Mr. Rogers and other members of the Appropriations Committees in both bodies and the leadership came together to ensure that it doesn't happen. We still have a long way to go. We still have much work that needs to be done. But by passage of this measure today, Mr. Speaker, we are going to do exactly what is necessary. We're going to finally have a clean slate. We've all commiserated over the fact that we had this uh, mess to clean up of the past, and uh, it's been ugly and it's been difficult, but we have, in fact, by virtue of this agreement, cleaned it up so that we can continue to work down this path towards balancing the budget, getting our fiscal house in order, and doing what we need to do, and that is our jobs is to create jobs, and uh, I think that we have a chance to do that. So, Mr. Speaker, I urge support of this rule, and I urge support of the previous question so that we can move ahead and make sure that we have what's necessary to meet this very important deadline uh, by midnight. My, with that, I uh, yield back the uh, balance of my time and move the previous question. Gentleman that yields back his time, all time having expired, the question is on ordering the previous question. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The opinion of the chair of the ayes have it. Mr. Speaker, I'll lady from, from New York. I request the yeas and nays. The yeas and nays are requested. Those favoring the vote by the yeas and nays will rise and remain standing. A sufficient number having arisen, the yeas and nays are ordered. Members record their votes by electronic device pursuant to Clause 8 and Clause 9 of Rule 20. This 15-minute vote on ordering the previous question will be followed by five-minute votes on adoption of House Resolution 500 if ordered. Motion to suspend the rules and, con and concur in the Senate Amendment to H.R. 1892. And motion to suspend the rule on S Senate Bill 278 if ordered. This is a 15-minute vote.
Late last night, the wheels were put in motion for the House to finish their work on 2012 federal spending, and they will do so in three parts. Here on the House floor, the first of four votes, this first one, 15-minute vote, a rule vote, a previous question vote before consideration of the rule for debate on the, uh, on the spending measures, because they're going to consider the uh, spending package in three separate parts. Part of that, the biggest part of that, is the nine remaining spending bills for fiscal year 2012. They include defense, energy, water, financial services, homeland security, or interior and environment, labor, HHS, education, legislative branch, military construction, VA, and state and foreign operations bills. Combined together, that's $915 billion in discretionary spending, which is subject to the uh, $1 trillion cap set in place by the Budget Control Act back in August as part of the, the debt deal. That's the first part. It will also be two other parts dealing with disaster relief. One is a disaster funding bill, about $8. billion in 2012 disaster funding. The second measure, a resolution, would offset the disaster funding by adding language to the disaster bill before sending it to the president, which would make across-the-board rescissions of 1.8 percent to uh, discretionary accounts to keep uh, in most 2012 spending bills. So the rule is um, the rule vote will be uh, following this one. This is a 15-minute vote, the previous question vote, and following that, uh, three other five-minute votes. Also, the um, uh, the House and Senate still have to finish work on the payroll tax cut. The House did pass their version earlier this week, but the Hill is reporting that House lawmakers expect to leave town today and return next week to deal with the extending the payroll and the tax holiday. The Speaker of the House, John Boehner, mentioned that today in a very short briefing with reporters. We're going to show that to you during this 15-minute vote. Uh, the House today uh, will vote... Uh, on a conference report to fund our government for the balance of uh, this fiscal year through September 30th. Uh, bill's been put together in a bipartisan, bicameral fashion. Uh, and I'm going to thank uh, Chairman Rogers uh, and the appropriators for uh, really starting the process, restarting the process, if you will, uh, of building uh, an appropriation process around here that works. I'm not going to describe it as perfect, uh, but certainly. Uh, a process that we haven't seen for a number of years. Uh, for this will uh, mark uh, for the second year in a row uh, that we will spend less money on the operation of our government uh, two consecutive years that we've con uh, cut spending. Uh, we also take steps in this bill to stop some of the excessive regulations that are harming our economy. And for the first time in modern history, uh, there are no earmarks in this bill. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm grateful that uh, we were able to come to this point. Uh, we still have more work uh, to do uh, on the jobs bill uh, if the Senate acts. Uh, but the House uh, will do its work today. The members will go home. And if there's a need to come back uh, to finish our work, we will do so. Questions? Uh, Speaker Boehner, what's your message to middle class families about the future of the payroll tax cut extension? Will it be a two month uh, carryover? What should families expect by January 1st? Uh, the House uh, the, House is, uh, the House has done its work. Um, we're waiting on the United States Senate. Uh, but these rumors that are floating around here about a two-month extension, I'll just say this. Uh, if that bill comes over to us, we will make changes to it, and I will guarantee you that the Keystone Pipeline will be in there when it goes back to the United States Senate. Mr. Sp Mr. Speaker, what do you think of a two-month extension to the payroll tax cut? I just gave you an answer. How much clearer could I be? Pardon me? Would those changes be to uh, dealing with a two month time frame in addition to the All I'm going to tell you is we will make changes to that bill, uh, and I'll guarantee you the Keystone Pipeline will be in the bill when it goes back to the United States Senate. Let me put it another way. If you had the Keystone Pipeline, <laughs> is, is two months enough for you? We will make changes to the bill, and one of those changes will include the Keystone Pipeline being in there. Thanks. Thank you. Speaker Boehner from about an hour ago votes underway. Procedural vote on 2012 spending. Democratic leadership has come out to uh, speak to reporters. We'll take you back to the Capitol now to see that as this vote continues. Purpose made uh, by Senate uh, Major Minority Leader Mitch McConnell uh, that I referenced yesterday when he said the single most important thing that we can achieve is for President Obama to be a one-term president. Uh, putting up those obstacles 
uh, it has not been a good thing. Uh, obstacles for job creation and, and it is, has not been good for the American people. Democrats are proposing a different path. Uh, Democrats are committed to reigniting the American dream, building ladders of opportunity for all Americans who want to work hard, play by the rules, and take responsibility. And we know we have much work to do. Uh, our, our ladders of uh, success have rungs that speak to make it in America. Mr. Hoyer will be speaking about that, about building the infrastructure of America, American-made, build America, and community recovery with a trained uh, workforce, creating jobs, educating our young people, lifetime learning, promoting innovation, ensuring dignified retirement for our seniors, growing small businesses, honoring the entrepreneurial spirit of America. Uh, this is what we should be about today and every day. Democrats will work to make sure that the American dream becomes a reality for all Americans. Again, uh, we, want, uh, we want to talk in a very positive way about what we need to do to make that possible. With that, I'm pleased to yield to the distinguished whip, Mr. Hoyer. Thank you very much, Madam Leader. I join you uh, in the lament uh, of 346 days of a do-nothing Republican Congress. Uh, there was a pledge made to America that things were going to be done differently. Uh, they were. Less substance, more contention, more confrontation, uh, less focus on jobs, less focus on infrastructure, less focus on a positive agenda for the American people. Americans are indeed tired of their House of Representatives failing to represent their greatest hopes and aspirations. The 111th Congress so far has been truly, as I said, a do-nothing Republican Congress. When comparing this year to the year Democrats took over the House in 2007, and I've talked to you about some of this, uh, the numbers speak for themselves, but as our leader has pointed out, uh, even more dramatically does, does the substance speak to the difference. And when comparing this year to uh, 2007, uh, Republicans passed 165 bills, and 62 were signed into law. In 2007, we passed 478 bills, with 131 signed into law. Those bills were signed into law by George Bush, Republican President of the United States, with whom we worked on behalf of the American people. That is our responsibility, not as Mitch McConnell would say, to come here and simply to uh, hope for the failure and work towards the failure uh, of the uh, President of the United States, who happens to be a Democrat. Uh, a famous uh, American said, uh, uh, there are too many people in Washington uh, who, in order to drown the captain, are prepared to sh sink the ship. That is not what America expects of us. Uh, the more than double the number uh, was, in my opinion, quintupled in terms of the substance. That year, we also had to contend with the president from the other party, but we still were able to work together to make progress for our country. Uh, the most disappointing statistic from this Congress, though, is zero. That is the number of jobs bills the Republicans have put forward or called up for consideration. Now, I know they've called some of their bills jobs bills, but no economist uh, believed that those bills were jobs bills. As a matter of fact, uh, a Republican member of the United States Senate said that they were forgettable uh, bills, not the forgotten bills. We have been engrossed in a year of manufactured crisis with multiple threats of a government shutdown and an increase of uncertainty for businesses in our markets as a result of the debt ceiling held hostage this summer. That said, Democrats are still committed to working with our Republican colleagues to restore the American dream. The American dream is at risk, and therefore there is a lot of work to do. We believe in the American dream. We're the party of the American dream, and we're going to keep fighting for the American dream for average working men and women in this country. We want to do it by building ladders of opportunity and tearing down barriers to success for those willing to work hard, 
play by the rules, and take responsibility. The clock is ticking on a number of items that will help us uh, to do so. We have an agenda that we put forward uh, when we were in charge, passed six bills in the Make It in America agenda, uh, and have numerous bills and a plan so that people can make it in America. So those middle rungs on the ladder are there for the middle class. And rather than shrink it, expand it. Bring manufacturing back. Outbuild, out-innovate, and out-educate uh, our competitors so that our young people, our families, can see a future of hope, of opportunity, uh, and of a better life. That is what we're committed to today, uh, and that is what we will be committed to in the coming session of Congress next year. We must do better. We can do better, and working together, hopefully, we will do better. Obstructionism and politics ought not to be the focus of this Congress as it has been this last year. Let us hope that's the case. And now I'm pleased to yield to my good friend, uh, the gentleman from South Carolina, the assistant leader, Jim Clyburn. Thank you very much, Mr. Whip, uh, Madam Leader. For a year, uh, I have worked trying to tackle uh, the debt and deficit of our great country. I served on the Biden group, uh, and we met nine times, averaging two hours per meeting. On the 10th meeting, uh, the Republicans walked away, uh, rather than discuss a way uh, to get us on the program of shared sacrifice. Uh, later, we saw uh, the President sit down with the Speaker, uh, discussing a grand bargain, and we got nothing but positive vibes from those meetings. But on what uh, seemed to be uh, the closing uh, discussions, we saw the speaker feeling obliged uh, to walk away from the grand bargain uh, rather uh, than discuss how uh, to meet a program of shared sacrifice uh, by raising some revenue. Then we moved uh, to the super committee. Uh, we met time and time again. I said throughout all of that, uh, those discussions, that I thought that if it were left up to the 12 people in the room, we would be able to get to where we needed to be. Unfortunately, there was always a 13th member of the committee, a seventh Republican, who never attended a single meeting, but who was very present in all of our discussions. So rather than get us to a point uh, where we could discuss uh, revenue and come up with a program of shared sacrifice, once again, uh, we failed. So here we are today. Uh, we are approaching uh, the holiday season, uh, having missed many opportunities uh, and having responded time and time again to manufactured crises. And as we approach this holiday season, uh, I would hope uh, that we will leave town having restored some confidence on the part of the American people. We need, when we get back here next year, to do what is necessary uh, to protect voters uh, and to encourage voter participation. We see um, before us um, a sort of lack of transparency uh, in the voting uh, participation of our citizens. Undisclosed money, uh, secret money coming into campaigns. We see it already uh, in, the, uh, in Iowa and New Hampshire and all across this country money coming into campaigns, and we have no idea uh, where it's coming from. We have no idea whether or not the money is foreign or tainted in some other way. Next year, we ought to do what's necessary to disclose all contributions to have transparency in this process. I think that's what it's going to take for the American people to feel 
that we are, in fact, uh, acting on their behalf rather than on the behalf of some secret uh, folks that they know nothing about. I would also hope uh, that we will be um, uh, honest uh, with our young people. I think there's something wrong with saying to a student that you can use your student ID, go into a bank, and transact any business that you care to con transact, yet you cannot use that voter ID to cast your vote at the polls. And we see that coming in state after state, and my state being the marquee uh, in that process. I think it's time for us to get rid of these 21st century poll taxes, these creative devices, such as was used uh, back in the 18th, uh, 19th century uh, to deny people participation uh, in our uh, election process. So uh, whether or not you celebrate Christmas, Hanukkah, or Kwanzaa, I'm hopeful that all of us would do it in the greatest of spirit and come back here at the first of the year to do the people's business in a transparent way. Thank you, and I'll give back. Madam Leader. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Madam Leader. Yes, sir. Um, I wanted to ask you about the speaker's comments this morning. He said that if the Senate strips the Keystone pipeline from the payroll tax jobs bill, that uh, the House next week or whenever they come back to act on it, that they would stick it back in and send it back to the Senate. Are you able to uh, express a similar guarantee that the provision will not be in the bill that eventually goes to the president's desk? Uh, right now, the Senate, the, Sen the Sen two leaders in the Senate, Senator uh, Majority Leader Reid and Minority Leader uh, McConnell, are working on what that, might, that bill might look like. When we see it, I'll have a comment on it. Uh, I'd hope that it would be finished around now so that we could it could be written up and voted upon one way or another tomorrow. Uh, but again, until I see the bill, I'm not going uh, to comment on it. Yes. Yeah. The members should stay in town until a final deal is worked out on the payroll tax. Gotcha. But the speaker said this morning that he's planning to let members leave for the weekend and then come back on 24 hours notice. Is that something the Democrats will? Well, that's, yeah, we're saying we're not going to. Uh, yeah, we, we, we can go home for the weekend. I hope we don't. I hope the bill is ready uh, today that we they uh, uh, write it up uh, tonight. But so uh, it, it, it's no use if it's a question of writing up a bill uh, and uh, the mechanics of a bill and we vote on it next week. There's no reason for members uh, to sit here to wait for the mechanics of it to happen. But I think the president has been very clear uh, that we need to uh, pass the omnibus bill that will keep government running, and part of that uh, initiative is also to pass a payroll tax and an un uh, a cut for uh, 160 million Americans and the unemployment insurance uh, extension. Uh, whether it's Friday or Monday and who, you know, who takes time off to go to church, uh, that, that's not important. What is important is that we do not adjourn for this year of this session uh, without getting that, uh, that work done. Yes. You said that the Republicans have been responsible for manufactured crisis yes. over the course of the last year. Yes. Didn't Democrats sort of risk taking the blame for threatening to shut down the government this week when they held up the uh, anonymous? Uh, no, no, Senate? that's not the case. The Republicans took us to this place. Let's be very clear. Uh, part of the made up crisis that the Republicans, from day one, with the first con uh, continuing resolution, which we voted on. What, at midnight, Stanley, was it? Late at night. They always take it to the brink so that the option uh, for uh, uh, clarity in the public mind on it all is, um, uh, and our options for uh, legitimate debate uh, are narrowed. They did the same thing. Uh, no, I'm talking about made up crises, like the first CR that threatened to shut down government because of the timing. When you control the agenda, you control the timing. I'm talking about another, which was to leave in, uh, to question as to whether this Congress uh, would uphold the full faith and credit of the United States of America uh, by not even uh, by waiting to bring a bill to the floor uh, so that we didn't default, and then not even having the votes to pass it. Again, uh, we had to come through with Democratic votes to get that done. And now, 
by again taking all this to the last minute, it is up against the wall, but the timing is theirs. And, that, and, and this isn't, we, we do not want to shut down government. Uh, this is not, that's, I, I don't agree with your characterization, although I have respect for your view, I don't agree with your characterization. Mm -hmm. I think this is a made up crisis by the Republicans. This could all have been done a long time ago. In fact, we have a very good bill that is coming to the floor right now, and that's why we're going to have to leave in a moment to go, to go vote for the rules. Stanley, let do you let me make a quick comment on that, and I spoke to that uh, in my pen and pad. I think you were there. Uh, what Senator Reid said is everybody had agreed that three things needed to happen, at least. SGR is the fourth. Three things uh, needed to happen. Uh, number one, we needed to pass all of our appropriation bills. In this case, in an omnibus in a bill that's 1,207 pages long. I don't know how many of the Tea Party folks have read that bill or uh, whether they're out on the front lawn saying read the bill before you pass it, uh, but I don't hear a lot of that. Uh, secondly, notwithstanding their initial opposition, now every Republican says we ought to do 160 million uh, uh, people, uh, make sure their tax cut stays in place. And thirdly, uh, almost everybody agrees, at least publicly, that they are, uh, don't want the, those uh, who can't find jobs to fall through the cracks uh, and get a lump of coal in their stocking. So we all agreed on that. So what did the Republicans do? And what apparently have they done today? They have added an item that the President says he's going to veto. Contrary to their pledge to America, and their pledge to America said they would not add extraneous matter to must-pass bills. So when you ask about the manufacturing of the crisis, it was manufactured by adding extraneous matters to must-pass bills that essentially we have agreement on. The, 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 um, the megabus, the, um, the appropriation bills, uh, the uh, tax cut for the middle, uh, middle class working Americans, and uh, making sure that people who can't find jobs don't fall through the cracks. I'm going to add that to that. I'm going to add to that this. Mr. Hoyer made it very clear to the Republicans that when bills come over that do not have policy atta riders attached to them, poison pills, that we can cooperate and vote together on them. And, and, we, did so. and we did so. In this omnibus, they had hundreds of such riders in the bill. Hundreds of such riders in the bill. Uh, and so it took some time to talk them out of them, to, to show them the wisdom of getting rid of those unwise riders. Mr. Hoyer and I and Mr. Clyburn we're all appropriators. We're from that culture. We respect the appropriations process. And it is not to be a vehicle uh, to put things on that could never get a, pr a presidential uh, signature or pass the House and Senate unless they were on what we, Mr. Hoyer calls a must-pass bill. So the time that we had to take to take us up to this last day was to get rid of hundreds of obstacles to passing a bill that would be signed and that is called a made-up crisis. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Democratic leader Pelosi and also representatives Clyburn and Hoyer speaking with reporters this morning. Live coverage here on C-SPAN as the uh, first vote in the House continues. This is a procedural vote ahead of the vote on the rule for the three measures that will constitute uh, completing uh, work on 2012 spending in the U.S. House. Those will be, uh, that'll be a five-minute vote. Two more five-minute votes will follow some more debate ahead on the uh, legislation. You may have seen the, the uh, speaker, John Boehner, earlier talking about the payroll tax cut legislation. The expectation is now that the speaker is saying he will bring the House back next week to take up that measure because it, it did pass the House earlier and the Senate has yet, earlier this week, the Senate has yet to deal with it. In that briefing, the Speaker said, quote, I guarantee the Keystone Pipeline will be in there when it goes back to the United States Senate. That's that provision that was part of the extension of the payroll tax cut, uh, cut package, which would ask for the President to uh, require the President to make a decision on that Keystone Pipeline within 60 days. So this vote winding down, three more ahead in the U.S. House.
39. The yeas are 179. The previous question is ordered. The question is on adoption of the resolution. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Gentle lady.